Congratulations, really. Um, if you don't mind, I, I, I wrote a statement. Anybody mind about that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Is it true? <laughs> you get kicked out. Uh, okay, it's not for a moment. Uh, I'm quite sure my Oxfordian friends and colleagues, including myself, will be picking apart this movie, scene by scene, frame by frame, pointing out the various ways in which it takes certain liberties with the historical and biographical record. But I suggest that this process is a very good sign, good thing, and I want to tell you why. First of all, think about the fact that no one, not a soul on either side of the authorship issue, ever had any historical or biographical problem with the popular movie Shakespeare in Love. <laughs> and the reason is that, oh sure, the movie was draped in some historical facts of the time, the closing of the theaters, the killing of Marlowe. Same thing all biographies, biographies of the Stratford man end up doing. But at the same time, everyone knew and everyone accepted that the personal story of Shakespeare in love was pure fantasy. Everyone knew there was no need to pick it apart, no need to criticize. Because in plain fact, there is no orthodox or accepted biography of Shakespeare, the great writer, whatsoever. <clears throat> that story is all padding, all burger roll, with a ketchup and the mustard, and no beef. <laughs> nothing. There's nothing there, nothing to pick apart. But now Roland Emmerich has given us a real, genuine something, a story set within the framework of real events of real history involving real individuals. Earls of Essex in Southampton, William Cecil Lord Early and son Robert Cecil, Queen Elizabeth and of course the Earl of Oxford and the works of Shakespeare and Ben Jonson and so on. Now we should recognize that Shakespeare in Love did in fact represent, however, a giant step forward by coming up with a story that, even though fictional, finally connected the author with his works. I should elaborate by saying briefly, it finally connected the author's life some of the circumstances and situations of his life with his works. And he came up with a fictional story that included a personal motive for the man writing what he wrote. Roland's movie has humor, but it's not a comedy. Anonymous is based on real history and biography, but it is not a documentary, not a documentary film. And while it does have some good sexy parts, tastefully done, as things go, <laughs> it's not a romance. Roland has put on the screen what some of us, many of us, have been saying for years that the Shakespeare story is fundamentally a political story about politics and power and how the winners get to write the history and how telling the truth can become an act of treason. Anonymous delivers what the advertising suggests, a political thrill. And I submit that this represents the turning point in Shakespearean biography for historians, and if you will, for the literati. It has been recognized, of course, that the 45-year reign of Elizabeth can be divided into two separate but unequal chapters or parts. First is the first three decades, up to 1588, the first 30 years, ending with the England's victory over the Spanish Armada. And, the, and, and, and there's a fantastic story there. But then the second part, the final 15 years of the reign until the death of the Queen in 1603 and the succession of James of Scotland. And it's in this second part, the final 10 years, when Shakespeare, the printed name, suddenly appears. In 1593, as if from nowhere, without any foreground of apprenticeship or early work, with a full-blown masterpiece of narrative poetry, Venus and Adonis, and the great author introduces his name not on the title page, but rather inside the book as the printed signature on the dedication to Henry Earl of Southampton. And here is the great political framework, the 10 years of struggle for control of succession to the throne from 1593 to 1603. Here are the elements we find in the movie that we've just watched. Shakespeare putting himself politically on the side of the so-called Essex faction led by Earls of Essex and Southampton. And in the following year, Shakespeare tells Southampton on the public dedication of the rape of the priest, as we heard in the film, what I have done is yours, what I have to do is yours, being part in all I have devoted yours. And he didn't mean Raoul write more poetry, even though he did. 
In real history, the great author is well aware of his relationship to Southampton, father and son, based on much evidence that I and others happen to agree with that relationship as it, as it is revealed in the movie, Anonymous. I intend to talk more about that and the new evidence that's been thrown into the hopper very recently in the last few days by Catherine Children in her new book, Shakespeare Suppressed. In one stroke, Roland Emmerich has taken the great author's biographical story away from that small group that's calling itself authority. Earl of Oxford in Sonnet 66 complains that art, his art, is made tongue-tied by authority. And he might be shocked to find out that that authority has kept him tongue-tied for centuries. But no more. Now the doors are open, the chains are off, and the game is afoot. And I'd like to close by citing a recent finding by scientists at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute that when just 10% of the population holds an unshakable belief, that belief will always be adopted by the majority of the society. A new idea held by less than 10% is stuck in the mud. But once that number grows above 10%, the same idea spreads like a flame. Thanks to Roland Emmerich and Anonymous, it looks like we might well get there. <laughs>